Hello, my name is Renate McNay and you are watching Conscious TV. My guest today is Cheda Mali. Hello, Cheda. Hello. Cheda was another recommendation by our viewers and we are happy to have you here. Um, so Cheda, let's talk a little bit about how it all started, your childhood. Mm -hmm. You said uh, you had already with six profound insight into the nature of reality and many experiences. Yes, that's right. Yes, when I was a child I had uh, many unusual experiences that um, I wasn't fully aware at the time that not everybody had them. Yes. Uh, but they all concerned uh, the structure of energy, the structure, or the structure of the universe being made of energy. And so some of those experiences were uh, very much in my internal environment that I was experiencing states and levels of perception that were completely outside of normal day-to-day -day perception, conscious perception. Um, but there were also some quite fun things that happened, you know, right. especially for a young young child, yes. Yes. where... Um, I was able to explore simply with intent the um, molecular structure um, of material objects also. And so, so when you as a child, I guess you didn't really have the words for what you were experiencing. And luckily I didn't need any because these experiences always happened when I was by myself. How, how did you know? Well, that's the curious thing. When uh, you look back over your life, this sense of knowing is a, a continuous thread. And when you're young, you accept that level of knowing much more readily than so. when you're older. Yes. Yes. And so, uh, as strange as it may seem now to uh, an adult mentality, mm -hmm. at the time, you know, around those early years, I just simply didn't question what I was experiencing. So you didn't go to your parents and said, I saw an energy structure <laughs> and I saw that? <laughs> well, I did have some very unusual experiences with time, yeah. where the nature of time would c collapse and move into a different framework. And yes. so I would be, my experience would be on a completely different time frame to everybody else okay. so that made things like you know walking and thinking you know very difficult yes. and I did mention that to my mother and mm -hmm. um, but after several times of telling her about this you know she just became alarmed or thought that I might have brain damage or something of course. and yeah. took me to the doctor and the doctor yeah. said oh she's just delirious mm -hmm. uh, and so they didn't investigate it further and I learned not to bring it up anymore. Yes. So, so you say you had, with six, the understanding of what reality is. Mm. So you, you had the complete I had the, I had, picture. Well, I had the six-year-old's version of that. Yeah. And because the truth is simple and profound, the six-year-old can appreciate the simplicity of it because the truth yeah. doesn't change. It doesn't. You don't get a more complicated version yeah. when you're older and yeah. you access truth. You get the same version, but to the six-year-old, it appears very matter-of-fact. And how did it look like? How did reality look like for a six-year-old? It looked like uh, millions of subatomic particles that were infinitely suggestible so for me what I experimented with at yes. a young age yes. was the connection between uh, one's thoughts mm -hmm. and the effect that had on that energy field on that energy matrix right. and also not just thought but intention and I found that experimenting with certain intentions I could affect not only the energetic structure but the physical structure Amazing. And um, so they were fun experiments. So, did you <laughs> use that in school? No, I didn't <laughs> use it in school. I should have done, should I? <laughs> you just had the intention to write the best grade and... I should have used it, it that way, but I didn't. <laughs> yeah, no cheating allowed. So how did, how did it affect, you know, being, 
you know, being at school and having friends and playing with them. Well, and funnily you, enough, not at all, yeah. because it didn't seem abnormal in any way. Yeah. So <clears throat> these were experiences that took place when I was very young, and I had unusual, I've had unusual experiences of that nature all through my life, which are yeah. now commonplace and, and no longer unusual, I yes. should say. Yeah. But... Uh, but my upbringing was surprisingly normal. Yes. I, you know, I lived in, in a house with uh, my parents and my sister, and I had yeah. friends, and I played, and I, you know, went horse riding and did my schoolwork. Yeah. And yeah. had very normal relationships. Yes. So that, that was remarkably normal. And when you were, for example, sad and you had pain, did the understanding of who you were, or what reality were, give you the holding to go through all this emotional thing, or how did that work? It worked that uh, gradually over time, yeah. I started to build up a personality, just like everybody yes. does, and I followed the same trajectory that most children follow yeah. of um, making certain assumptions around identity. Yes. And I had... Um, uh, maybe a double life, if you like, mm -hmm. whereby I was still experiencing the development of an identity at the same time that I had an intuitive understanding of how the universe worked. Yes. But I didn't... It was very innocent when mm -hmm. I was young. Mm -hmm. I didn't try to... Um, <clears throat> I didn't try to use that knowledge to override any form of identity Mm -hmm. You know, because I didn't perceive anything to be wrong with it. Yes, um, yes. So, but I had this kind of dual understanding. But a lot of my knowingness when I was little came as uh, an intuitive, whole, um, whole concept feeling. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like um, remote analysis that I made certain conclusions about. No, it came as a, it came as a whole finished experience, and yes. so there was very little to analyze. Yes. Mm. So, but then you, the split happened, and you developed more and more mm -hmm. into being mm -hmm. an identified human being. Yes. And uh, then I think you were. Yeah, you, then some spiritual masters appeared. Yes, they probably thought, oh, she's going too far off track. <laughs> <laughs> we better step in now. Okay. Um, yes, in my... I always had <clears throat> an ability to um, connect with that that barest form of existence, you know, the energy level of existence. I yes. always had a very strong connection to that, and I never lost that. Yeah. But it wasn't until I was in my late teens and early 20s that um, these um, disincarnate masters started to appear to me and give me guidance and teachings. And then I was more formally initiated into, uh, I guess it would be like an apprenticeship. Yes. Um, to then uh, disassemble the identity uh, piece by piece yes. um, but the value of having it form and being able to disassemble it consciously is that anything you've experienced consciously you can say you know mm -hmm. so being able to do that consciously gave me uh, understanding that was so valuable so I wouldn't I wouldn't change it for anything right so what did they teach you Lots and lots of things. Um, and did you hear voices, or what, was this just like again an overall feeling? No, it was. It was more specific by that time. You know, yeah. obviously, my my physical development and my uh, emotional development, my mental development, was at the stage where I could handle that connection. Yes. And so I, my consciousness had matured to the point where I was ready for that connection. Yeah. So I could see them. Yeah. with my um, internal vision. Yes. I could also feel their presence and yes. I could hear their words and I could uh, sense also um, their teachings. So mm -hmm. not all the teachings were given through words. Some of them were just like a direct transmission. Mm -hmm. and, and I went through an apprenticeship like any apprentice would right from the beginning. Uh -huh. 
um, making sense of all the things that I had learned as a young child. But really, the the main uh, body of those early times together was steadying my consciousness. And did they give you some exercises to do, or or? pointed out certain things or no it wasn't quite like it? a schoolroom but <laughs> <laughs> well, when you say i was an apprentice yes uh, it well sounded like the apprenticeship the, was more for my life work here on earth at this time i understand yes yes, yes. so um i was being prepared for that yes mm -hmm. good so and then when you were 20 um you went on this 20 year journey what did you find I found I found some beautiful uh, philosophies yes. and religions and yes. I put myself into the hands of those you yeah. know looking like most people do for answers uh, within those teachings so yes. I studied um, Tibetan Buddhism with Tibetan masters. I studied uh, Theravadan Buddhism mm -hmm. with Theravadan masters. Mm -hmm. I studied uh, Vipassana. I studied um, yoga and Hindu philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I was <clears throat> exploring all of these areas, looking for um, like a complete theoretical structure of what I had experienced. Yes. And... Whilst I found many beautiful teachings, many beautiful masters, especially the Tibetan masters, you know, they're so, so jolly. Yeah, you said you, you met the Dalai Lama. I met the Dalai Lama, the yes. famous Rinpoche. Yes, and, yes. Yeah. Many, many masters. Mm -hmm. And Ajahn uh, Buddha Dasa, who was uh, the head of the Theravadan uh, order. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, I found that these teachings, and certainly the people who were following them, were caught in some kind of net that wasn't serving them. And it wasn't until I was prepared to step away from the teachings and not rely on the teachings mm -hmm. that uh, I had my own uh, truth realisation. So right. it was being prepared to not rely on teachings, not rely on teachers, yes. not rely on any external form of guidance. Mm -hmm. Even my own masters would step back to the side and allow me to have that realisation. And that's when uh, what I had experienced previously, all of the uh, experiences of my life and um, my existential understanding of each moment came together in a continuous realisation. Hmm. So how, how can you tell me more about that? Well, the, the, the understanding... Of who you are, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what this reality is, mm -hmm. what you sensed intuitively as a child um, was present in a, in, a, in a much more profound way. That's right, exactly yeah. right. So yeah. there was, in each moment, there is, uh, there is something giving rise to that moment. There yes. is the present moment. And so the uh, ability to recognize that is our consciousness. Our consciousness is that is our ability to notice. It's our ability to explore. And so our conscious attention has to be in the present moment in yes. order to understand that present moment. So you are talking in the moment about our personal consciousness. Well, it's, it's, um, it's a question whether consciousness is personal. From my experience, yeah. consciousness is universal. Even though you imagine, you, it appears to be personal. Yes. Because it operates on your free will. You can move your consciousness to rest yes. in whatever you like. Yes. But even that, from my perspective now, doesn't seem particularly personal. Yes. So was there a moment or, or a shift where you felt your personal understanding mm. or awareness was like reabsorbed by the universal field? Yes, more than that. It, it dissipates. It dissipates to the point where it just evaporates altogether. 
Yeah. And so what you're left with, it's like you've got you've got uh, eternal existence, yes. which is consciousness arising in the present moment. And present moment is synonymous with awareness, which is synonymous with existence. So you've got this yeah. vast energy soup of existence, yes. which is what I first interacted with when I was younger. Yes. I was interacting with eternal presence. And now my consciousness is no longer anchored down in to my day-to-day -day life. It's no longer perceiving that consciousness through the auspices of an identity or a personality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not needing the personality to appear real. So once a personality is taken out of the picture, consciousness is able to perceive awareness directly. Yes. And so when you're perceiving awareness directly, you're not perceiving something outside of yourself. So you still have a self, but what you perceive that self to be changes. Right. Because previously when you have an identity, when you have a personality, <laughs> consciousness is present, but it's anchoring down into the personality. And so all of the messages, all of the feedback it's getting are of that nature. So what you say, there is no gap anymore. There's no gap, yeah. There's no middleman. There's no middleman, mm, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. There's nobody doing it. Yes. And just life. And it's just life living <laughs> itself. And you, there's still volition, there's still volition, but that volition then is accepted to be universal volition. It's not taken to be individual volition. Right. Mm. So in the moment something is happening in your life and you might be drawn in or identified, then your knowledge is right there. Yes, yes. Gives you the holding again. Mm. And yeah. the whole uh, mental analysis, which is the, the product, you know, the, of the personality, the mm. identity, mm -hmm. and works very much in concert with it to keep the identity in its structure... Right. That mental analysis is gone. Yes. So you're not second questioning, you're not working off fear and doubt anymore. Uh -huh. You're working just off direct perception of truth and yeah. therefore there's no there's no margin for error and there's no margin yeah. for uh, for fear and doubt to, yes. to come in. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Cheddar, you mentioned that you spend hundreds and hundreds of hours mm. practicing. Mm analyzing mm. all that. Why, why did you do that? To be certain. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. Yes, because... but that happened before, of course, the realization. Yeah. That's what I stepped away from, that yeah. you need... Uh, and I still subscribe to the fact that you need a certain amount of practice. The consciousness needs to be trained to be steady in the present moment. Yes. Because... Consciousness is a mirror, and if you hold the mirror steady, that which it reflects is going to be a more accurate picture. If your consciousness is shaky, mm -hmm. because it's drawn here and there and everywhere yeah. by the ego's wants and desires, yes. then that, that mirror is going to give a very distorted reflection back. Yes, yeah. I understand. So, yeah, so there's a certain amount of practice is required. Yeah. But not in order to be truth realized. So how 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 was your practice? How did your practice look like? What, what I, I gave thing? it away altogether. <laughs> 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 I, I went for about ten years without a practice. Yes. No. But but then when you when you were in this oh. practicing you meditated and you analyzed your thoughts mm -hmm. and what have have you and uh I was, I was being a good student, doing what the teachers tell me to do. Yeah, yes, sure. Yes, so, um, <clears throat> well, there was many different, there was many different uh, streams that I explored during mm -hmm. those years, mm -hmm. but the, uh, the commonality between them would be that you're using consciousness to explore your reality. Yeah. But what I never found in those teachings was the explanation of why it happened and how it happened, just that that's what you did. Yes. And so it wasn't until I put my own experience of my early years, having that direct perception yeah. 
of the energy field and how that operates, how it's structured, what its nature is. Yes. When I put that together with the, the discipline I had learned from my practice, yes. then that's what gave me the combination to allow me to, to perceive that energy field. So you directly. would say today it was useful? It, Everything is useful, yes. It, it didn't really bring you to... <laughs> no. No, it's useful it's because nice. you get to see uh, what it doesn't do. Yes. You get to see what it doesn't do. Yes. And most... Um, certainly a lot of the... Uh, philosophies and teachings, not just the ancient ones, but certainly the modern day ones, mm -hmm. the, the, the New Age tenets, and um, they're all dealing with just shifting the furniture around in the temporary identity. Yeah. And that is misleading and to some extent time-wasting. Yes. Um, and so I developed my own body of work to allow people to access... Uh, eternal truth much more quickly not to have to bother moving around temporary truth yes yes, yes. yeah I uh, so yeah if you we, we go to your work later the way you work so then you were given permission by again your spiritual teachers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to work as a spiritual that's right. Teacher. They let me loose on and, the public. And, a <laughs> and um, that was your vocation in life, yes. I guess, yes. to be a mentor now and yes. a international uh, speaker, spiritual yes. teacher, mm -hmm. an advisor. Mm -hmm. You travel around the world. Yes. And being very busy, do you feel um, at home with it? Do of, you course. Feel, um, of course, of course. I think you have a family. Yes. And how does that all fit together? Um, with a good schedule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And a good team at the office. Yeah. Mm. Yes, I have four beautiful girls. And four? Four. Wow. Mm. Between the ages of five and 18. And wow. uh, so they are. They're yes. a happy bunch. They're beautiful. Yes. But they're all part of my... Um, my crash course in humanity, getting to know what happens here and how it works. Right. Mm -hmm. It's great. Yeah. So, and then you developed a whole teaching. That's right. Yeah, you said uh, you moved away from the philosophical mm -hmm. uh, approach to a more integrated That's right. teaching and yes. approach. And you developed this whole teaching. And we have here your whole teaching on the table. <laughs> you call it Seed of Enlightenment. Yes. So I, I put it, um, show it to the camera, Seed of Enlightenment, with Cheddar Miley, and uh, there's also a DVD recognizing the truth. That's right. So what is your teaching? Mm -hmm. What is on these CDs? Well, these CDs, uh, these two are the first and second part of a three-volume set. Yes. So uh, the first set, Seeds of Enlightenment, um, helps to introduce people to uh, the structure of existence, yes. the laws of existence, yes. the qualities which are inherent within existence. Yes. Because if you're going to make a pot, you need to know what the material is that you're making it with. Right. You need to have a direct relationship and understanding with the energy which makes up all of existence. Yes. So this is an introduction into how that functions, the cogs and the levers mm -hmm. that allow you to access it, interact with it, uh, and maintain a relationship with it. Yes, yes. So that's the first volume. The second one, Embracing Freedom, deals with the specific hurdles that we face as human beings here on the earth you know some some and many of which i have experienced myself yes um yes. do and you still experience them not really <laughs> <laughs> i know no one wants to hear that do they <laughs> no not really yeah and what happens if your children are experiencing it 
I I have uh, a good perspective now. Yes. Yes. On yes. That. yes. Can uh, are they open? They're to, very open to your teaching. And then... They're not at the right age. My eldest daughter, the eighteen-year-old, yeah. uh, she listens with a wry smile on her face. But most eighteen-year-olds, yeah. you know, yeah. want to discover their mm. own truth. So I guess they pick up the vibration anyway. Yes, yes. yes. The younger ones certainly uh, work directly off yes. the vibration. Yes, yes. And and your husband, how does he deal with it? Quietly. <laughs> <laughs> what does what does what does that mean? <laughs> uh, it means that uh, he is a good example of um, the Taoist way. You know, just just being the truth and not needing to talk about it. Yes. yes. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. nice. Yeah. So the second volume, the Embracing Freedom, yeah. is designed to help people uh, meet and um, and embrace the freedom that is inherent within human existence yeah, because yeah. it's not a punishment you know it's a beautiful journey and we explore how uh, the human life is the manifest expression of this nature of awareness that we discover in the first volume and the third volume is infinite grace where we explore the uh, innate qualities within existence like love and beauty yeah. and uh, grace and uh, expansion light yes so and and uh you told me or i read somewhere all these cities or uh, all your work is done in an alpha state that's right i guess we are all more open to mm-hmm. receive that's right this message well it enhances our perception because normally our perception feeds off where our consciousness is sitting yes. and our consciousness is normally sitting in a lot of mental activity yes. and so that's going to scramble a lot of the um, interaction we have with direct awareness Yes. It's almost like a scramble mechanism happening mm-hmm. on our ability to perceive direct truth Yes. So in, in your seminars, um, do you find people start having experiences? Yes, very or, much. Uh, what, what? Yes, very much so. Well, I, I, my consciousness, my level of consciousness and that of the masters that I work with yes. is encoded into all of the work. So we, it's like we provide our conscious awareness as the arena in which people can make these discoveries and follow these teachings. Yes. Uh, and that facilitates them to be able to uh, learn much more quickly. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so which kind of experiences do people have? You know, they're very uh, sweet and uh, graceful. There's, it, uh, at this work is, n- is totally the opposite end of the spectrum from catharsis and wrestling with your demons you know it's yes. just it's an introduction to the exquisite beauty and mm-hmm. grace that mm-hmm. is within all life mm-hmm. so people start to perceive that they start to experience that not as a a remote sort of end point that they're going to reach if they just practice enough are good enough control themselves enough all of right. these things that people try to do in order mm-hmm. to reach enlightenment mm-hmm. But they realize in every single moment, if they would just bring their consciousness into the present moment where awareness resides, they can have a direct experience of that. And that direct connection expresses the nature of awareness. And so they find themselves experiencing their beingness as synonymous with awareness. But for this, Cheddar... We have to be very slow, move very slow, and conscious, very conscious the way we move through life. So we're told. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know when I'm, you know, in my automatic mood and running through the house and doing all kinds of things, there's yes. no, yes. no awareness, just getting the job done. <clears throat> Yes, yes, I understand what you're saying. Initially, 
you're right, it does help to have peace and quiet yeah. and, to, and to look within. And we use all of our teachings, use one's own framework, one's own experience, one's own life yes. as the environment for the exploration. Right. So wherever you go, you take that with you. So in every moment, there's an opportunity to make that connection. So initially, you need peace and quiet to be able to explore your own environment, your internal yes. environment. Yes. But once that truth is established, once it's seen, you know, it lays down conscious pathways within your energy field, and then it belongs to you. So you don't. It doesn't matter what speed you move at, the truth doesn't disappear. So what you say is, knowingness is enough yes. to be enlightened? Yes. So who is knowing? Who is knowing? Yes. Consciousness, existential consciousness, yes. is directly perceiving existential awareness. So awareness is perceiving itself. Consciousness is the faculty, the noticing faculty, which belongs to awareness, which allows awareness to perceive itself. So when you're asking who is seeing, yes. awareness is seeing, existence is seeing. Existence exists, we know that. Mm -hmm. But there's no way for existence to know itself, because yes. it just is. Yes. So consciousness is the faculty which arises out of awareness. It still belongs wholly to awareness. Yes. It arises out of awareness to to create that mirror, that reflection, that light, to be able to see itself. So, so then this is not I know, it, then it would be just knowingness. You can say I know, but your I belongs to universal consciousness and the know belongs to, to the experience of awareness. So you can say I know, but you're yeah. the voice of Awareness saying, I know. You're not the voice of Jedamali saying, I know. Right. So uh, it's very interesting because before you, before this interview with you, we had somebody here who spoke um, on non duality mm -hmm. and he said, Knowingness, knowing that knowingness is not enough. <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's. I guess it's just everybody experiences it different. Well, ultimately everybody know. experiences it the same. The pathways yeah. they take there. Yes. But it may be a case of semantics, which it often is when we get down to words. Yes. It may be, it's not so much what you say, it's what you mean by what you say. Yes. So what he may mean is that uh, mental knowingness is not enough. And in that way, I would entirely That's agree true. with there's him. A, that there's a difference. And for us, yeah. experiential knowingness is the key. Because as we right. said before, um, you can't say that you know something until you've experienced it. Yes. Because I can know everything there is to know about sailing a boat, but that yes. doesn't make me a sailor. I only know how to sail once I've experienced it. Yes. So experiential knowingness is absolutely enough. That's all there is. Mm -hmm. So there may just be a little case. So what you say is, I I might have had an experience of the truth, but what happened if the experience did not stay? Is it not then my personality? who tries to go back to this experience or talks out of this experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Initially, yes, it is. Right. So the, what, what um, takes us out of that state yes. is that our consciousness moves. When we're in a state of union, yes. it means our consciousness is fully focused upon and perceiving pure awareness directly. Yes. That creates the union. There's no middleman. There's only that union. And that's what you experience. You experience the unified state, the unified paradigm. Yes. Um, which is direct truth being expressed. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if your consciousness is not trained to be steady, to remain in that, then it may start to drift into uh, 
identity desires yeah, or, yeah. you know, slight thoughts which arise and hook up your consciousness and then yes. run with it somewhere else. Yes. And so then your experience changes, not because awareness has gone anywhere, yeah. but then your thoughts have given the command to this energy of awareness mm -hmm. to now manifest the experience of that which you're thinking of. Right. But it's still taking place wholly within awareness. Yes. And so what we teach people is not that you have to change behaviors or apply some kind of external yes. principles onto your experience, mm -hmm. but more that right there in the moment of that distraction, because awareness is the medium in which the distraction is taking place, you can just subtly shift the focus of your consciousness back into direct awareness mm -hmm. and the so-called distraction just evaporates like that. So it is really a training. How, would you say we can train ourselves to be more and more it's not a it's not a particularly um it's not a particularly uh, exciting word is it training no <laughs> no i couldn't think about <laughs> so, it. It, it doesn't about <laughs> it doesn't exactly convey yeah um, well it's almost like you train a muscle yes you know yes you train yes. consciousness yes yes but you know training implies that <clears throat> you train now in order to achieve something in the future that's true Whereas the process of discovery, the process of truth realization itself is beautiful yes. and is expansive and light-filled and harmonious because that is the nature of awareness. Yes. So um, the whole process of discovery is delightful in itself. So that's why training doesn't accurately convey the enjoyment and the... Yeah realization and the relief that one experiences as you're bringing your focus always into yes uh, direct conscious yeah. awareness so awareness is always aware of itself no it's not awareness is existence exists that's that's the ultimate truth existence exists right. but consciousness is the faculty through which awareness experiences itself. So consciousness, this is why people say that consciousness is expanding. Yeah. Awareness itself is an is a expansive, uh, light-filled, harmonious energy source. Mm -hmm. That's fixed. The nature of it is fixed. The existential reality of it is fixed. The part which is negotiable, which which moves, which learns, which grows, which changes, that's consciousness. So it, the ability of awareness to know itself is growing. So that's what's changing. And that's what we and all the other forms of existence are engaged in. We are the eyes of this growing consciousness, yeah, which is why we could say, I know. Yeah, and uh, never... Never anybody explained it like this or took consciousness and awareness as two separate mm. things. Yeah, and, and sometimes they're used interchangeably, which can be confusing. Yes. So that's why we try to explain what we mean when we say consciousness, yeah. what we mean when we say awareness. Awareness for us is synonymous with existence. It's the energy of existence. So would you say there is evolution in consciousness? In consciousness. So consciousness is evolving? Yes. So... Would you say the teaching you have is part of the evolution? Yes, very much so. The masters that I work with oversee the conscious evolution of mankind. So where is it all going? Where is it all going? <laughs> well, you know, whenever I've asked for visions of the future, and, you yeah. know, many people do ask because of 2012 coming up and, you know, a lot of fear and deliberation about yes. where it's all going. Yes. Um, I'm always shown a vision of a beautiful earth, absolutely exquisitely beautiful earth, completely in harmony mm -hmm. with healthy ecosystems and, and a human race that is cooperating and um, getting along in which year? admirably. <laughs> in which year? Are we still here? <laughs> 
Yes, the human race is still there in that vision. I mean, am I going to be here? <laughs> is it within the next few years? It's it's a it's a process of unfoldment. So, yes, yes, yes. You know what yeah. what's happening at the moment is that as consciousness expands, mm. its its frequency changes, and particularly for the Earth, the consciousness of the Earth has been operating very much in a third dimensional uh, reality. Yeah. So yeah. only what it sees does it believe in. You know, mm. and that's why, you know, the separation mm. of the body has ha held such sway for so long yes. here, the yes. notion of separation. Yes. So now those energies uh, surrounding the planet are moving into a fourth and upper fourth dimensional frequency, yes. which means that the, the underlying frequency which was supporting, you know, the molecular structure of matter is now quickening, which is why all of the structures that we've relied on, you know, the financial structures, the religious structures, the societal structures, the family structures, that's why all the structures are breaking down, because the frequency of consciousness now operating on the planet is reaching a point where it no longer supports yes. this, um, the illusion of separation. Yeah, you told me you also do a lot of work in big companies, and actually tomorrow you go to Romania yes. to work in a company from the size of uh, IKEA. <laughs> what, what do you teach them? Do you learn them, teach them already the new level of frequency? Uh, I teach them what I teach everybody. Although yeah. I do, a, you know, a, a simpler, like work-based form of it. Yeah. And because the truth doesn't change, and so. Um, our our work is all about you know allowing people to perceive truth directly so we we show them the tools that you need in order to do all that and there's consciousness yes. everybody has the ability to notice yes the present moment yes everybody has that we we have nothing else but that yes and our ability to seat our consciousness into the present moment is the beginning of all of the teachings because what we discover when we do that is that the present moment starts to reveal itself it starts to reveal mm -hmm. its hidden structure its hidden qualities mm -hmm. that it's its function its purpose right and so at the beginning but there are you know in my experience there are layers mm. between consciousness and the present moment and um, and at times I just cannot be in the present moment. I'm taken taking away through a concept or certain feelings. Mm. How can you? Uh, what can you do to be more in present. the present mm. moment? Well, <clears throat> many many people's journey relies on them reaching an end goal when they reach the end goal they're going to get something nice like enlightenment yes and so there's not much incentive to stay in the present moment yeah because all oh, the goals over there anyway that's right yeah so w what we do with people is that we take them through a series of exercises which is exactly what we've done here yes. with these tools yes and in the exercises, you experience, and this is the key, you must experience the present moment. Once yes. you've experienced it, there's, it's so rich, it's so calming, it's so exciting, it's so expansive, that there's the incentive is built in to keep coming back, keep coming back, because every time you do so, you, you experience expansion, lightness and harmony. And so it's like a self-drawing mechanism. So this is what we say, you know, you, you realize that there's nothing at the end of the road. Everything you've ever desired is right here in this moment. Mm -hmm. So we help people to explore the present moment experientially. We guide them initially at first. Yes. And to learn to see what is there, what is always present. And so you are never, it, it changes the whole nature of learning on its head. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not a linear path anymore that you have to follow. Mm -hmm. The richness is right here, right now. 
and it's accessible in every moment at, at any time. So when people are in the midst of great suffering mm -hmm. or pain, of course they don't want to be here. Well, you say that, but we've taken people who are, are experiencing great suffering and great pain. Yeah. And when they follow our guidance into the present moment and make that shift and are willing, they are willing to just shift their focus and start to notice what is also present. Yes. That the pain and the suffering that is that they feel in the moment is really just the manifest form of the thoughts and the beliefs that they are pulling into the present yes. moment. But the awareness is supporting that and providing for that in the present mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. Once they make that subtle shift, that, that understanding, mm -hmm. then right in the midst of pain and suffering, people can just turn like that and the pain and suffering literally disappears in an instant. Literally. Right. Well, it's, not, it's not a metaphor, it's an yeah, actual experience. I, I experienced it, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But I also, as I was listening to you now, to you now it was like, I mean, the mind is so tricky. Yes, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> it said, yes, you just have to surrender and then the goodie is waiting for you. <laughs> Well, again, this is you know this is another it's, approach that is commonly used out there that people will try to fight their mind with their mind. Yes. Which we we don't employ the mind at all. The mind sits on the reserve bench. Yes. yes the mind is tricky. It operates at very very subtle levels. Mm -hmm. Even when people think they're truth realized. Yeah. The mind is still running the show. Yeah. So oh, we don't employ the mind to do any work for us because everything that is eternal already exists mm -hmm. right in each moment so we use consciousness which is the faculty we've been given through existence to explore the mind is not yeah. the mind is useful if you are trying to compare dog food in the supermarket or yeah, yeah. judging the distance when you're driving yes but it's not the tool to decipher the vastness of awareness yes. so we don't employ it we simply employ consciousness directly on awareness and because consciousness arises out of awareness in the first place it has a direct relationship already so that's where the knowingness comes in yes when it perceives awareness it, it it's self-evident the knowingness yes. is self-evident and as you get you get the experiential feedback which lets you know where and how you're navigating yeah yeah so this knowledge cheddar is this a knowledge which came out of your consciousness? Is this a knowledge which came through the Masters? It's, it's eternal. It doesn't have a name on it. It's eternal. Yes. Yes. It belongs to existence. Yeah. We've, we've, we've tried to give people the, the simplest, most accessible and most direct form of truth knowledge mm -hmm. when you say we yeah sorry <laughs> we know that's confusing for people as a... <laughs> we we as a as a group of masters all oh, right so mm. that's that's what uh, mm. you you are constantly in touch with this guidance i mean i would call them inner guidance mm. um, you call them masters mm -hmm. so you are actually able through your teaching to shift uh, a whole company around yes yes and we've had uh, we've had a remarkable journey there yes. you know, because you know in Romania they have a lot of difficult conditions they've just come out of a long period of uh, you know repressive uh, communist yes. um, government yes. and uh, there are a lot of uh, social issues and material issues that people need to deal with yes. and um, they are not attending seminars to get enlightened or no, you know no. th that's that's not their interest mm. so we very gently introduce people to you know that they themselves are a source of harmony they themselves are a source of comfort and beauty and just to gentle their experience of being mm. so we're not trying to um, do anything you know grandiose yes just do you find a difference in working with 
people, let, let's say, in Romania or America yes. or yes. in Europe? Yes, yes, there's a difference. Which kind of difference? Are um, there? Well, you know, it's, as it's already commonly understood, you know, people with a lot of material wealth have a lot more... Uh, mental baggage yes. and neuroses and you know yes. they have they have a different uh they have a different set of luggage that they carry around yes. to people who have material hardships yes uh and, and maybe difficult um you know societal conditions yes um yes yes there's one another interest you have which i really liked um Uh, it's also my interest I think we have about one minute left it's about child development mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yes um, my interest in child development stems again you know as a very uh, intuitive connection I have with children yeah, yeah. and part of my uh, presence here in this incarnation was to uh, look at the way that children are brought up and to provide some information, some guidance and some teachings also for parents that when they are dealing with children, yes. they know what they're dealing with, they can support the child's true uh, spiritual development yes. as well as their physical, emotional and mental development. Yes. Yes. So that's something that I feel uh, very passionate about. Yeah, and are you going to do more work in that field as yes. well? Yes, well, as the schedule allows, which is not much, uh, yeah. I'm hoping one day to write a book and put together a little DVD on this topic. But nice. uh, I've looked very deeply into anthroposophy, mm -hmm. uh, which are the teachings of Rudolf Steiner yes. on the subject. Yes. And I've applied... Uh, a lot of that in my own uh, parenting yes. and found it to be very, very, very deep and very insightful. Yes. But the, the teachings of Rudolf Steiner are very, um, very wordy yeah. um, and very difficult to understand mm. for the yeah. average lay person. Right. Yes. So um, I've, I've used my own knowledge to distill certain... Uh, mm. Uh, es uh, essential truths mm -hmm. into an approach to parenting mm -hmm. that uh, beautiful that I apply in my own life and hopefully yeah. well Jenny we have to finish now and um, your words were, were really very close to my heart so I'm very happy that you were here and I want to show you a CD so you're teaching again it seats of enlightenment so that's number one and number yes. two number two yes. and uh, coming out in July 2010 the third one which is Infinite wow. Grace yes the third and final yes mm -hmm. great and um, you will find Jeddah's uh, website running underneath so you can get in contact with her and We thank you for watching Conscious TV and thank you Cheddar for You're most welcome. coming. Goodbye.